The following is part of Cornell Contemporary China Initiative Lecture Series under the Cornell East Asia Program. The arguments and viewpoints of this talk belong solely to the speaker. We hope you enjoy. So welcome to this evening's CCCI lecture. Uh, we're very happy to have Professor Bai Ga with us today, uh, who's come from Duke, uh, where he's in the sociology department. Uh, his PhD is from Princeton Sociology Department in 1994. And he has been working on actually a, a number of things, a, a broad range of things since then, but recently uh, has been interested in the sort of geographic imagination uh, in, in China and some, uh, some of the impact of that on various fields. So that's what we're excited to hear about today. Please join me in welcoming Professor Baikal. Thank you, Robin, for inviting me to this great opportunity to share with you about what I have been doing in the past five years. Uh, let me start the outline. Uh, basically, I will talk briefly about the rationale of One Belt, One Road China Initiative. Also, I want to talk about the two strategic goals this initiative tries to achieve. And one is to hedge against the sea power with land power. The second one is to become a global power in three different processes which are associated with this initiative. Then I will talk briefly about the three major issues related to this initiative, namely TPP, South China Sea, and China's relations with the Islamic world. Okay. All right, so to understand the logic of Chinese one belt, one road policy, we need to start from the US grand strategy for the 21st century, at least uh, claimed by the Obama administration. Basically, what you can see here is that uh, on the Asian Pacific side, uh, we got this uh, TPP, we got uh, Pivot to Asia you know, as a national defense strategy and uh, TPP as a trade strategy. On the European side, uh, it's a NATO expansion. That's not really new, but uh, it has implications even to the Ukraine crisis. Also, we got this TTIP. It is being negotiated right now. Hopefully, uh, both deal could be, uh, you know, I mean, TTIP could be achieved probably this year. Then you got a strategic uh, uh, contraction in the Middle East. So pretty much, this is a general strategy of U.S. Uh, you know, at least for the current administration. Now, what's the consequence to China? Basically, pay to Asia is to bring all the strategic pressures on China, at least the seen from the Chinese perspective. Namely, uh, not only U.S. wants to pay it to Asia, everybody else wants to join U.S. to pay it to Asia. So all of a sudden, you know, uh, China is under hot spot, and it feels you know the great pressure uh, because of this. So basically, there were you know, two natural responses in the Chinese IR community. Uh, liberalism often emphasized, I'm talking about not liberalism in general, but the Chinese version of liberalism. In China, when you talk about the liberalism, it always highlights the importance of cooperation. But in many ways, in many occasions, it seems to have a wishful thinking about, you know, cooperation. And uh, also, when other countries try to hedge against China, these people, you know, under their rationale, would to remind other countries, you'd better look for your co-interest. Don't let the co-interest being undermined. However, what they didn't understand is that hedge against the rights of China is also other countries' co-interest. So they just don't understand this part. So when other countries begin to take non-cooperative position, you know, these people cannot offer any effective solution. That's why they often get criticized by the general public. Realism, however, uh, emphasizes the importance of a confrontation. So if you uh, read the Chinese media in the past three or four years, it's full of this kind of expression. Uh, there are a number of scholars uh, making strong you know, argument uh, taking from this perspective. 
and it's well widely supported, uh, you know, especially by the so-called fengqing, you know, angry youth. So this perspective is problematic in the sense that it is based on the assumption China now has the power pretty much to fight against an ally, you know, organized by the U.S., uh, neglecting the fragile nature of the Chinese economy. Actually, before uh, 2008 uh, global financial crisis, China published, you know, the trade ratio every year. The so-called uh, dependency of trade on, I mean, dependency of GDP on trade. So uh, the highest percentage was 72 percent back in 2007. So with such, you know, portion of GDP is related to trade, this guy argue for war. You could imagine, you know, what's going to happen if a war really starts. So the danger of both positions actually lies in the fact. Oh, I'm sorry, I got a typo. Not that line. Uh, they may lead to extreme nationalism and war very easily. Uh, for liberalist position, uh, you can face a very strong domestic backlash. You know because uh, many you know uh, so-called uh, public intellectuals who have argued the cooperation position got criticized by you know, uh, mass media, sometimes even the media you know, uh, within the party. Also, the so-called angry youth you know, in the internet. And also, uh, the, la uh, the second one, realist position, you know, pretty much tries to fan fire nationalism from very beginning. So it's, uh, you, know, you can get uh, lost control very easily, and uh, it has appeared in a number of occasions when the China-Japanese relation got, you know, lost hand. So this is the background. You understand why uh, China got this one belt, one road uh, initiative as a grand strategy for the 21st century. So from the map, you can see basically, you know, the RCEP. Uh, regional cooperation of economic partner is pretty much aims at a counter TPP, and also uh, they have a different uh, term for this 21st century maritime, you know, economic uh, Silk Road. That one is a Silk Road economic belt. So basically, one is on the Eurasian continent. The other one is in the Asian Pacific region. So pretty much, uh, you know, for the Silk Road economic belt, uh, it aims at as a hedging uh, action against the strategic pressure, you know, resulted from both pivot to Asia and the TPP. Now, this is what the so-called one road, one belt indicate. As you could imagine, you know, there is uh, uh, actually this is heavily sustained by the construction of infrastructure projects, uh, which I'm going to talk briefly later. But now, as you can see, when you talk about uh, the so-called Silk Road economic belt, pretty much it would come across the Eurasian continent entirely. Uh, also, it includes actually the Middle East and the North Africa. You know, so it also covers pretty much uh, South Asia, Southeast Asia. Of course, when you talk about Southeast Asia and South Asia, you know the 21st century maritime uh, Silk Road also include. Uh, you got both, you know, the ocean part and the land part. What's the strategic goal for this initiative? Pretty much is to divert. You know, the strategic pressure resulted from the pivot to Asia uh, actually back to the Middle East. Uh, sometimes people may not understand, actually to my interpretation, uh, part of the Ukraine crisis and the part of the uh, 5 plus 1 Iran nuclear deal were all consequences of the strategic interaction between China and the U.S around, you know, pave it to Asia and one belt, one road. Why? If you were putting 
before you decide to take back uh, Crimea, you have to make some kind of calculation about the geopolitical risks. So without the strengthened relationship between Russia and China, he probably dare not to do it. Also, actually, the Obama administration, if you recall the, the public discussion uh, in the US media, before this initiative to uh, make this nuclear deal with Iran, actually, the think tank circle, even the media and the academic community have thought about the military solution for a long time, throughout you know, the post September 11 years. But all of a sudden, it changed the gear. Why? Of course, one interpretation is Obama just want to leave his own legacy. But my interpretation is, if you look at uh, what's going to happen from this map, Iran will be benefited most due to its geographical location from China's initiative for this uh, uh, new Silk Road uh, economic belt because of strategic location. So the southern pass of Eurasian land bridge has to go through Iran before it can go to anywhere. So as a result, Iran leaders can see the benefit very clearly. That's why he would agree to you know, make this agreement. And the real loser, I think, is Saudi Arabia. So basically, you know, this is pretty much the first strategic goal to hedge against sea power uh, by with uh, land power. Uh, basically, the hygiene strategy's aim is not to confront, but to divert the pressure. You know, uh, ba basically, it tries to build a counterbalance by demonstrating to uh, other countries that China does have alternative options. So if you force China too much, from the ocean side, then it just go to the land side, the continental side, uh, by directing its economic resources, because that has you know significant impact on the neighboring countries. Also, we need to make it clear, the Chinese strategy actually is a geoeconomic strategy, it's not a geopolitical strategy even though it has implications to geopolitics. Why they are different? Well, think about uh, you know, the basic assumption. In geopolitics, the perspective is often zero-sum. The assumption is you know, there is a conflict of interest among different nation states. Therefore, you have to take care of yourself by you know, confronting uh, any rivals. But in geoeconomics, it's completely different. The approach is a win-win. You have to take a win-win approach you know, to do geoeconomics. The assumption is there is overlap of interest among nation states. If you collaborate, the market will be bigger. When the market becomes bigger, everybody will have more opportunities. So, as you can see, taking different perspectives here would lead different perception of neighboring country. Because if you take the geopolitical perspective, you know, 14 or 17, depending upon how you count, you know, neighboring country of China, each of them, if joined with external forces such as US, would become a major threat to China. But if you take a geoeconomic perspective, you know, all these 17 countries offer possibility to expand a unified market through you know, regionalization of the economy. So different assumptions will lead to different perspectives. Different perspectives will lead to different outcomes. Okay? Now, let's talk about the uh, infrastructure construction. So it started from you know, domestic railroad system uh, in China, uh, after 2004, actually, uh, China decided to you know, uh, import foreign advanced high-speed rail technology 
and uh, it cut deal with uh, Siemens of Germany and uh, also a Japanese company, French and the Canadian companies. And uh, after, you know, only about 10 years now, by the end of last year, the operation uh, mileage of China's high-speed rail is already 19,000 kilometers. It's about 60% of total of global operation. Okay? So this is pretty much about the uh, lines with high-speed rail so far that have been achieved. You know, all these have been you know, pretty much between 200 km per hour and 350. Now, thinking about infrastructure construction as a major driving force behind the so-called Silk Road economic belt, you can see this map. You know, the dash line indicate, you know, the uh, operation line under either proposal or being constructed. The solid line means it's already opened. And actually, uh, it started from Chongqing. After Huang Qifan became the mayor, and, you know, he tried to get uh, uh, HP to produce laptops in Chongqing. And then they all told him that, you know, Chongqing is pretty much about here. They say logistic cost is too much. Then he offered that, you know, after three years, if we cannot solve the problem, I will subsidize whatever transportation cost you have. So, you know, in exchange, uh, major computer producers have gone to Chongqing and they got a, you know, big uh, production capacity. So in order to uh, shift the laptops to the European market, uh, Huang Qifan did, you know, made a great effort uh, pretty much negotiating with five other countries, you know, they uh, organized a joint company uh, with logistics and just uh, gave out a share free to these other five countries. So eventually it was done. In the past two years, especially after the official announcement uh, of the Chinese government for the uh, Silk Road Economic Belt, different cities in China have started sending, you know, the freight uh, line, you know, to European countries. I think currently it's between eight to, nine, uh, eight to ten different cities uh, which have been doing that. What is most interesting actually is about these two. One is to Kazakhstan, you know, through the Caspian Sea, then to Azerbaijan and Georgia, then through Black Sea to Ukraine. As you may know, after the Ukraine crisis, uh, the Russian-Ukraine relationship deteriorated very quickly, and the Russian government does not allow, you know, Ukraine's uh, goods to be shifted through land to China, and the Ukraine decided to do this, you know, this line. It's very imaginative, and it started the operation last month. Also, uh, when Xi Jinping visited Iran last month, seven days, day, uh, seven days later. You know, a train from uh, Xinjiang went to capital of Iran, so uh, Turkmenistan. You know, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan to Iran. So these two have been in operation already. And then uh, you talk about uh, many things. For example, this one: uh, China has started the construction uh, in Laos. Uh, also, uh, have already uh, reached agreement with uh, Thailand. Uh, the uh, Malaysia-Singapore high-speed rail is going to open for bid this year. Uh, China will be a central player. And uh, also the Myanmar railroad you know, has been proposed and agreed. However, due to the political change, uh, China decided to you know, slow down. And also there is a planned uh, railroad between Kashgar and uh, Guada, you know, the seaport uh, which has been you know, managed by China uh, since two years ago. And actually, uh, everybody believes that uh, there will be an uh, extension from Pakistan to Iran, then through Turkey into Europe. And uh, two years ago, I was invited to a workshop uh, in Saudi Arabia. And I told my host that actually, there's another way you think about it namely to build an under-ocean tunnel 
uh, between Iran and Oman, uh, going through Saudi Arabia and Yemen, then you build another big bridge on Red Sea, then, you know, Chinese train can go to Africa. And uh, that will solve the three major crises, you know, uh, Saudi Arabia is facing. So when Xi Jinping visits Saudi Arabia this year, I pull out my old article, you know, published in the Chinese media, and many people say, well, why don't you publish earlier? I said, well, they don't like it. So, the major domestic pull uh, to, I mean, uh, condition to support this, uh, you know, uh, Silk Road uh, economic belt is to turn Xinjiang or Western China into a major driving force behind the Chinese economy. So as you may know, uh, in the past 30 years, pretty much the Chinese economy was based on the Eastern coast. You know, it's an exporting model. Uh, you know, the 40, uh, 14, you know, coastal cities and uh, a number of economic zones have been the major players in this uh, whole process. But if you look at Xinjiang, Xinjiang is a one-sixth of total territory of China. However, its GDP share is only 1.3%. It's unbelievably low. But if you change that number, of course, you know, China has more than 30 you know, provinces, and uh, you know, if you change that number to 6%, then the power of the Chinese economy to lift Central Asia, South Asia, Middle East will increase substantially. If China is able to do that, then it means that the Chinese economy will stand on two legs, not only one. Because in the past, it's only on the East Coast. It's only one leg you know, to support such a gigantic economy. So what China has been doing, actually, is to connect the already existing railroad system on the Eurasian continent. Uh, this is pretty much, you know, the situation. Probably this map is five years ago, five years old. What China has been doing actually is trying to build a connection, you know, especially among this part. So uh, to what extent, uh, you know, that will be successful, we have to wait and see. But at this moment, you can see Chinese effort in this bigger picture. Now, talk about the hedge part, you know, the hygiene strategy. So if you look at it from the map, the global map, uh, the weight of Silk Road economic belt, you can see more clearly. You know, for if you just exclude, exclude you know, South Asia and Southeast Asia, just look at China, Mongolia, and Russia to see how big they are. You know, it's already huge enough. Of course, we have to factor in many other things like population and technology, effectiveness of government. But from the geographical dimension, actually, you know, the weight could be heavy as a counter you know, balance. So the second strategic goal, you know, the first one is to hedge against the sea power with the land power. The second strategic goal of One Belt, One Road is to become a global power three, uh, through three processes. Actually, this part, you know, uh, media has picked up this part, uh, you know, uh, intensively. But if you try to bring them together, you can see more clearly. Namely, the first is to establish China's position in the international monetary regime. Okay? So if you talk about the global power, you have to talk about you know, uh, its strengths in the international monetary regime. Uh, I will make a comparison with the US immediately. And so far, China has been trying to finance the infrastructure construction project by providing you know, the liquidity to the international economy. Basically, if you need money, you go to China to borrow. That's pretty much many, what many uh, countries' leaders have been doing. Second is to establish uh, China's leadership position in the so-called international political order by collaborating with the so-called emerging powers. Okay? I will 
give you more clear pictures later when I talked about the TPP. The third one is to pretty much uh, establish a China-led global production system uh, centered, you know, around uh, uh, direct investment, uh, you know, around the so-called uh, Silk Road Economic Belt and the Maritime, you know, uh, Economic Road. So basically, uh, if you want to know why, look at the non-military dimension of U.S. hegemonic power. When you talk about the U.S. hegemony, military always the number one issue. But actually, the hegemony is sustained by many non-military factors as well. So these are the three I could think of, namely the dollar as a key currency, and the U.S. has a you know, major supplier of liquidity of, to the international economy, has been the major factors you know, to support the U.S. leadership relations. Also, U.S. led multilateral international institutions uh, represented by United Nations, World Bank, you know, IMF, you know, also NATO and other bilateral military treaties with 69 countries. Third one, the global production system led by U.S. multinational corporation. So if we go back to one page, you look at what China has been doing with the one belt, one road, it's exactly the same thing. Okay, so that's pretty much the second strategic goal for China's initiative. Okay, let's talk about the one by one. Uh, China has become a major you know, supplier of liquidity to the uh, international economy. So the BRICS Development Bank you know, it has uh, $100 billion and uh, it's going to start operation this year. And we just read the news uh, uh, last week, actually. Uh, they have already got the office building set up. The Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank is also $100 you know, billion. And uh, the operation is already started. And uh, hopefully, they say they are going to finance the first group project very soon. The Silk Road Fund actually is controlled solely by the Chinese government. Uh, it has $40 billion. So from this dimension, these numbers tell you um, China has indeed become a major supplier of liquidity to the international economy. So in that sense, it helps China to consolidate its position in the so-called international monetary order. That's why China finally got into this uh, special drawing right you know, at the end of last year. Now, Speaking of China's collaboration with other big countries, especially you know, developing countries, Russia would be the first to come in mind. In 2013, uh, China and Russia did two joint huge military exercises. And also China has collaborated with Russia at the United Nations you know, about the Syria policy. And also in the Snowden case, uh, if you remember, the escape pass, you know, that also involved uh, China-Russian collaboration. In 2014, actually, they added more. Uh, there was a huge gas and oil contract, and also they announced uh, both countries are going to build jointly the so-called floating station, nuclear station, floating uh, nuclear station, and also big commercial aircraft. That would become a major you know, challenge to both Boeing and uh, Airbus. Also, this part is also interesting. They decided to join to create you know, this uh, credit ranking agencies because they believe that uh, that has been dominated by the US. So this is on the Russian part. Let's talk about the India. Uh, China's relationship with India is much more complicated uh, than you know, the relationship with Russia because now uh, all major Western countries try to you know, attract India away from China. Also, it all offered great opportunity for uh, India you know, for certain economic uh, interests. But at the same time, uh, China and India uh, have agreed to think about at least the so-called China, India, Bangladesh, and the Myanmar economic corridor. 
Uh, it's proposed by Chinese Premier Li Keqiang back in 2013. But in the policy making circle of Indian government, uh, you know, there were many, uh, uh, many people suspect about that. But uh, uh, according to the Indian media, actually, lately, uh, there is a you know, tendency towards the cooperation. In the high-speed rail, uh, they offered the first contract to the Japanese, and they already offered the second one, not official, but they pretty much in the deal uh, to China. And actually, the university at which I'm directing a center of uh, high-speed rail research, uh, that university actually will also help India to actually build its own railroad university, specializing in railroad, train you know, the personnel. That one is the most imaginative proposal made by Indian government. So far, China has not agreed, but only agreed to consider. Namely, Indian government proposed, since you guys try to build the gas pipe, you know, from Russia to China, why don't you extend that to India? And it sounds a good idea, but there were, you know, both strategic factors and economic factors, you know, that would affect the final outcome. But now it's still, you know, in, uh, in the discussion. China's uh, co collaboration with the BRICS uh, has been intensified. Uh, now, actually, all of these countries recognize, you know, uh, they have, you know, the political benefit, at least, to demonstrate or for the, you know, interest of showing, uh, you know, in the international arena. But this part is interesting. Two years ago, China, for the first time, decided it's going to build a public platform to discuss security-related issues, okay? So in summer 2014, uh, 14, uh, 24 countries uh, went to this conference held in Shanghai. CICA means Conference on Interaction and the conference, uh, Confidence Measure Building in Asia. It's a very complicated name, but 24 countries joined. So I used uh, MAP2, you know, pretty much to color the 24 country. As you can see, you know, the potential is quite big. All right, the third one, actually, when China tries to build its own global production system, it has to be supported by investment. So this is what, you know, China have been doing. Uh, in the China-Pakistan economic corridor, you know, the investment was for, uh, 46 billion dollars. Also, according to the statistics uh, published uh, at the end of last year, China now has over 100 industrial parks in the world. In, of course, most of them are in developing country, in Africa, in you know uh, South Asia. Oh, some of them actually is in Eastern Europe and also in Latin America. Now, you often heard the term production capacity cooperation, you know, uh, meaning you know, China got an overbuilt production capacity, therefore you know, they can reduce the price to take overseas project. So according to the official statistics, uh, by the end of last year, actually last year they got you know, $215 billion project in overseas. And the mergers and acquisition would be another major dimension. Uh, throughout the last year, it's a $102 billion. A lot of them, especially last year, actually took place in Germany. Uh, Chinese companies began to spend aggressively to purchase you know, uh, companies in Germany, uh, aiming at you know, uh, the technology and uh, also the managerial skills. All right. So now, let's talk about the TPP. There were three major issues faced by Chinese initiative. The first one will be TPP. But at this moment, what we can see is whether TPP will be ratified by the 12 countries is still unclear, right? So the major presidential candidate in the US, at least at this moment, all oppose uh, the current version of TPP. 
But we could imagine, you know, uh, I think the Congress leader even warned Obama, saying that uh, you'd better wait after, you know, the election finish, then you vote on TPP. So, I would say the impact of TPP on China to a large extent depend upon how well China is prepared, you know, because it's more about uh, China domestically than, you know, internationally. Uh, if 10 plus 6 can sign the RCEP agreement, you know, uh, by the end of this year, this is what they promised to do at the end of last year, namely by the end of 2016, they will sign this country, uh, agreement. It's a regional free trade agreement among 16 countries, uh, 10 uh, ASEAN members, plus China, uh, Japan, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand, and India. So if that happened, you know, uh, both TPP and RCEP, uh, if both become effective, uh, most people believe they will become just the steps towards uh, APEC-based free trade agreement eventually. So uh, that means neither of them is going to become dominant. So if you look at uh, this part, it's quite interesting. Uh, seven countries currently have, you know, uh, double membership in both. They are member countries in TPP, they are also member country in RCEP. Two years ago, uh, at a Stanford conference on TPP, I said that, you know, since these countries try to, you know, uh, protect their access to the two largest markets in the world, U.S. and China, then U.S. and China will become the biggest loser, you know, if both happen. Then after I said that, a think tank people from Washington, D.C. said, actually, its institute did uh, computer, you know, uh, simulation. The outcome was the U.S. will be the biggest loser. So at this moment, we don't know. Actually, at least uh, probably that would wait for much more uh, studies about the effect. But at this moment, what I can say are three advantages of RCEP for the political reason. First, RCEP acknowledges the differences of the developmental stage of membership countries. You know, if you are uh, Laos, for example, or Myanmar, you are allowed to have a tougher policy towards foreign trade, you know, than other countries. More advanced countries should open more. So that's pretty much the first principle. The second one actually is uh, RCEP is uh, centered around ASEAN. Politically speaking, it has some wider political support. Because as you look at the TPP, you know, it's only four countries of ASEAN a membership country. And the third one actually is more interesting. They would allow different time, you know, to join RCEP. If you are not ready, you don't have to sign. Whoever signed, you know, the RCEP would become effective. So that's pretty much the, you know, three advantages of RCEP has. But we still have to see you know, whether it's going to happen at the end of this year. Now, even the TPP becomes effective, the uh, adjustment cost will be high. If you look at these trade number, I just uh, got these number two days ago, actually from CIA's the World uh, Factbook. If you look at the export and the imports among the TPP countries with both US and China, you can see that uh, Canada and uh, Mexico are two different exceptions because that's pretty much through the uh, NAFTA. It trades heavily with the US, but for all other countries, it's a different story. So let's say, suppose the TPP becomes effective, then the adjustment of international trade system to make it work will be very you know, high, and many corporations have to shift you know, around different country, they shift their production base to other countries. That would take how many years? We don't know. However, one thing many commentators have mentioned is that the consumer price will increase substantially in the initial stage if they decide to shift from China to other countries. 
also, the reason I said, you know, uh, how much the TPP would affect China depend upon how China is prepared. This is a McKinsey 2010 consumer report about China. So if you look at, uh, you know, the first uh, two groups, uh, according to its estimate, the affluent group between 2010 and, uh, you know, 2020 will increase five times. The second group will increase 12 times. So what does that mean? It means that China itself would become a gigantic consumer market. And as you know, all trade agreement, uh, you know, mutual. So if China has to pay tax or tariffs uh, for its exported goods, then when other countries' goods come to China, it's the same thing. So this would give China a big leverage. If you look at the number of 2014, this is the latest number we can find from World Bank. China currently is pretty much about uh, you know two thirds of the U.S. market in terms of the you know in imports. So uh, how many countries and uh, you know uh, co uh, companies can ignore or neglect such a huge market? So that will be a big test. Actually, this is more interesting because, but I have to say, it may not happen. It may be slowed down. This is a very famous Goldman Sachs report back in 20, uh, 2007. It's about the G7 group over time defined by the size of GDP. So if you look at this table, what you can see, not only the fact that by 2030, you know, China would surpass the US, but if you look at the very left, you know, column, U.S. will be the only current G7 member country to remain, retain that status by 2050. So, you know, when I talk to this with my colleagues and the students, I often ask them one question. If, suppose, U.S. universities to train future leaders for the next generation, what do you think? By that time, if that happens, how does the U.S. deal with the other six big countries that have completely different political economic system and also they differ sharply in terms of value orientation? So that's, you know, a major foreign policy issue, actually, if you think. Of course, again, it may not happen. It may be slowed down. You know, that is subject to many variables. But in case that happens, it's only 35 years away, okay? This is another way of showing the numbers about the changes of the size of GDP over time. So you can see here, Japan, UK, and Germany would become, you know, uh, number eight to so 10. These would be the top 10 economies, according to Goldman Sachs report. Then you got another one published by OECD, that's even more dramatic. Uh, by 2060, the combined GDP of both China and India will be bigger than combined G uh, GDP of all current OECD member countries. Of, again, it may not happen, you know, China may collapse, you know, <laughs> India may got big trouble as well. But if the trend really continues in that direction, it will have serious, you know, international political implications. All right, the second is the South China Sea uh, issue. I believe that this is the biggest challenge, you know, China faces now. And if you think about the South China Sea issue, you know, from the military dimension, uh, China is really in a very bad situation, number one. China, uh, U.S. has many allies, and also the geography is not in China's favor. And uh, partly, actually, why I debated with uh, some people in IR field, you know, in China, I think their understanding about the sea power is really uh, misleading. They only look at the aircraft carrier. That's an indicator of sea power. I told them, you know, according to the Western definition, if you just check the dictionary, 
you have to include, you know, oversee military bases, networks, and also, you know, allied country, sea power allied countries, as part of the hegemony of sea power. So China has neither of them. Then it still these guys believe, you know, China should push this sea power strategy. I think that's, you know, a little bit crazy. Also, from my research, you know, uh, about the German and the Russian license in history, when the major land power began to pursue sea power, it always led to a war. So, uh, unless China is ready, you know, about this thing, I think you know the current U.S. intervention in the South China Sea uh, issue actually is pretty much to maintain U.S. you know uh, military. Uh, hegemony in the, you know, on the ocean. So if you look at the current uh, military base distribution of the U.S., you know, you can see the U.S. is very strong. China has no way, probably for another 10 years or 15 years, you know, to even uh, counter this uh, military strength. Also, actually, uh, seeing from the outsider countries, uh, you see, many people would say, well, Chinese claim is not legitimate because how can you build your national border, you know, up to <laughs> other countries, you know, uh, immediate, you know, uh, ocean. But China also has its own claim. Namely, if you look at the different colors, you know, represent the different countries' occupation of these islands you know, in the South China Sea. Uh, what you can tell actually is, uh, you know, Vietnam has occupied the most. Uh, that's why uh, Chinese government often complain, you know, why, when these guys did the thing, why U.S. did not, you know, intervene. When we try to do something, you always, you know, criticize. So, uh, another dimension I want to emphasize is that when the U.S. thinks about the South China Sea issue, we'd better take a long time span about it. Because so far, I see this as a third major stimulation China has received from US. The last two, both has led to the Chinese favor. For example, in 1996, actually it's related to Cornell, when Taiwanese president visited the campus, you know, the Chinese government got angry so they did this, uh, you know, made it a missile exercise in the Taiwan Street. And the U.S. government sent two uh, aircraft carriers to the Taiwan Street. Actually, that's the major turning point for China to spend a huge amount of money to modernize its weapon system. So now, these days, when you talk about the Taiwan Street, you know, from the purely military dimension, it's no longer an issue. U.S. will not send the aircraft there anymore because of development of Chinese weapon. The second one is a 2003. In that summer, uh, Japanese and the U.S. government began to force China to appreciate its renminbi's value. Next year, China really started its innovation country initiative. Actually, high-speed rail was a product of that program. So, in that year, there were three major industrial policy debates about automobile, about big commercial aircraft, about you know, high-speed rail. So now, high-speed rail has become world number one. Uh, big commercial aircraft will have its first commercial test this year. So uh, I think about the last month, the news came out. They ha have already got its own engine designed completely by a Chinese company. So if this is a, another third stimulation, in another 10 years or 15 years, you will see completely different situation. So we have to take a longer time span you know, for international or foreign policies. OK, so this part is the most interesting part to myself. I have been working on this, you know, for some time, but it's quite interesting. Uh, China's relationship with the Islamic world would be a major, major issue uh, for the One Belt, One Road. Why is that? Look at the map. As soon as China wants to go west, 
it would encounter only two geographical blocks. One is the so-called former Soviet Union and its sphere of influence. The other would be, you know, the Islamic world. Of course, there is a mixture in Central Asia which belongs to both. So in that sense, China has to solve this problem in order you know, to light the uh, Silk Road economic belt to become successful. Otherwise, there is no way. Of course, you, if you look at you know, the energy dependence, uh, the US and China are at a very different position. People tend to believe that the US rely upon the Middle East for oil. Actually, that's not the case. You know, the U.S. dependence on the Middle East oil is only about 18 percent, definitely smaller than 20 percent. But for the Chinese case, it's something like around 70 percent. So in that sense, in order to, you know, maintain the supply of energy to China, China has to, you know, uh, maintain a good relationship with the Islamic world. Currently, you know, the ISIS has become major threat to China because on its uh, attack list China is number one you know, country on the list uh, as it tries to attack also this has been related to you know, some migrants from Xinjiang you know, through Southeast Asia they joined ISIS and some of them may have come back to China so that's how you know, China perceived this as a very big challenge However, to China, there were four major challenges, actually profound challenges, uh, you know, uh, deal with uh, the Islamic world. First, how does China as an atheist country deal with countries where politics is not separate, uh, you know, from religion? Of course, you can claim that, uh, you know, uh, China has established official ties with so many Islamic countries but when you put it in practice, immediately you see the differences. Because whatever happened in Xinjiang, you can see that would affect China's foreign relations with Islamic countries. You know? Not only the demonstration in Turkey, but also you know, attack in Thailand. It's all about the relationship between politics and religion, especially between China and the Islamic world. The second one is also interesting. Uh, this is pretty much both from the Chinese intellectuals reflection, but also you know, from uh, intellectuals in Islamic countries. They argue that you guys only see us through the lens of Western countries. Of course, through this lens, you don't see much positive stuff, right? I mean, the media portrays you know, the Islamic uh, civilization Normally, it's in a negative sense, but the Chinese uh, intellectuals and the media in the past uh, you know, 15 or 20 years have been heavily affected by Western media. So in that sense, that would affect uh, China's perspective. The third one actually is the most profound thing. How, not only China, but many other countries, how do you deal with the global trend of desecularization in the Islamic world. I know that in the religion field, actually, it has been a debate. Some people disagree, uh, you know, for the desecularization as a global trend. But at least in the Islamic world, that's the situation. There's no argument. Uh, usually, for the secularization uh, side, they argue that take a look at uh, Europe. You know, Europe is an exception. Yes. Everybody agrees, but not everywhere. So if you look at uh, you know, uh, other places, for example, the Turkish government just passed a regulation prohibiting you know, uh, lovers to kiss with each other in public. That's pretty much what happened last month. And also you, in Indonesia, uh, they have seen more you know, uh, violence related to religion, and in Myanmar, you know, even uh, the Buddhists began to, you know, kill the Islamic people, so uh, Muslims. So actually, the 
you know, desacralization has been a major uh, trend, at least in the Middle East, South Asia, you know, uh, part of China, especially in Xinjiang. If you study China's ethnic relations, the government has passed so many stupid policies, but most of them trying to fight against this desacralization trend, you know. The last one uh, will be this part, namely uh, when you deal with the Islamic world, basically there is no clear separation between international affairs and domestic affairs. Because according to that world will, all Muslim brothers belong to the same you know, civilization. They don't have the clear nation state concept. So basically uh, that's why when you know Thailand government uh, returned the migrant to China, you know from Xinjiang to China, immediately that you know demonstration in Turkey you know started. So to them, that's pretty much about Muslim. It's not about foreign relations. So actually, when I read the book talking about the Islamic worldview, actually that's really true. That's pretty much their worldview. So in that sense, you know, it's not just a challenge to China, but also uh, to many other countries. Okay, many challenges ahead for One Belt, One Road. Number one, ongoing economic stability. I think the exchange rate policy will be crucial, simply because China has to maintain high level of foreign reserve to finance you know, the One Belt, One Road. Uh, as you may know, last year China lost 500 billion foreign reserve, and last month is 100 billion. So if you keep lose in, with this speed, you know, very soon, Chinese foreign reserve will run dry, dry up. So if that happens, one belt, one road goes to nowhere because it's no longer, you know, uh, be financed. Also, the bureaucratic system and the country are not ready at all, you know, to run this kind of extended international program because China so far has not got that kind of experience in the past. You know, uh, one thing is about knowledge. You need expertise. You need to understand what's going on in foreign country, you know, in different fields in order to, you know, do things successfully. But if you look at an area study in China, according to one guy in the Ministry of Education who attended our workshop, he said that 60% of international study centers in Chinese university are American study centers. So if you want to you know, do the one road, one belt, you don't understand you know, developing country, then there's no way you can do that successfully. The second actually is more interesting. Actually, this is not only a Chinese phenomenon. It is also global. This argument actually is from the literature on uh, behavior of multinational corporation. Namely, according to this literature, pretty much multinational corporations simply follow their domestic logic in overseas behavior pattern. What does that mean? It means that in China, if you want to do a project, the government can force, you know, the resident, they take their land by force. If you don't agree, you don't have any other option. They give you some small amount of money, that's it. Also, if a company wants to get a contract, sometimes, you know, they do that through corruption. You know, you give money or whatever benefit to the top leader, that's it. But when the Chinese company tried the same thing in foreign country, it came with a very big political risk. For, for example, the bid in Mexico, you know, represented you know, precisely that logic. Uh, it's not that uh, uh, they didn't learn anything. The company did learn that in order to be successful, we have to, you know, uh, collaborate with a Mexican company. The company's boss actually was a brother-in-law of the president, so you believe that, you know, 
It's a strong tie. <laughs> it should work. However, what happened was that the president got a heavy political attack domestically. Eventually, also due to you know the uh, decline of oil price, the government revenue you know dry up. So, no longer have the money to finance the high speed rail. So it failed. And the Indonesia case actually is currently being intensively discussed in the Chinese media. And uh, the Japanese believe that uh, you know the Chinese are crazy you know, offering this kind of you know deal. Namely, the Indonesian government does not have any obligation. It's all the money are from China. Also, even doing that, they haven't got all the uh, you know permission to build. So far, they only get permission to build five kilometers. So apparently. The companies does not know what's going on, you know, in Indonesian politics. They even probably don't know how that system operates. So they, you know, step in, offer such a huge project. Then when it failed, you got a big trouble. So basically, a lot of economic challenges are ahead. But at the same time, something is also optimistic. Namely, one belt, one road is as much about China as about Europe, about Russia, about the Middle East, about South Asia and Central Asia. So you think about you know, uh, the implications of this initiative. It means a lot of positive future you know, possibilities to other countries. So currently, what you can see is this, uh, you know, uh, China-German uh, cooperation in industrial 4.0 project. I think uh, at Cornell, your very good engineering school also now uh, emphasizes this, right? So uh, for China and Russia, you know, officially they send, you know, the statement uh, acknowledging the so-called interconnection between. Uh, one Belt, One Road, and the Eurasian Economic Union. That's pretty much the project Putin has pushed for a long time. And this one, actually, uh, is the most dramatic case, the last one. When Xi Jinping visited Iran, at the end of the visit, both governments signed a joint statement. It says that uh, both countries will increase their trade from $50 billion a year to $600 billion a year in 10 years. I couldn't believe it when I read this, simply because the current trade level between China and the EU, EU is the number one trading partner with China, is about 560. Number two is the US, it's about 520. What the hell these two countries are going to trade with each other for $600 billion? You have to you know, have a very good imagination to think about it. But apparently, they are not going to talk about you know, just like a makeup. Why? Because when China and Russia talked about this back three or five years ago, they only mentioned that in the next 10 years, we are going to increase the bilateral trade from $100 billion to $200 billion. But with Iran, from 50 to 600. Apparently, something is there, but we don't know. Right? So what we can see is that you know, many other countries indeed see the future potential. Namely, eventually whether it's going to become successful, we don't know. Because at this moment, there are so many negative factors that may affect you know, the final outcome. Nonetheless, it looks like uh, you know, many other countries also got excited about it. Thank you.